A weekend off for MotoGP before gearing up for round three this weekend as we head to Argentina at the Autodromo Termas de Rio Hondo for the first time since 2019. The recording date is Monday the 28th of March. My name is Harry Benjamin. Alongside me, Crash MotoGP editor Pete McLaren and former Grand Prix rider and British champion Keith Ewan. Coming up, it's another case of Diplopia for Marc Marquez, but when will he be able to ride next? Next, news coming out from Malaysia as Sepang looks set to stay on the MotoGP calendar for another few years. Is there a rift developing between newly engaged, congrats, Jack Miller, and reigning champ Fabio Quartararo? And down in Moto3, it's more bad news for John McPhee, uh, plus everything else that we can possibly cover before this weekend in Argentina. Uh, But first, Keith. Mark Marquez, it wasn't confirmed the last time we spoke and the last podcast, but it has now been that uh, that huge high side he suffered in Indonesia has sort of sparked another case of diplopia. We're expecting an announcement this week about what that's going to entail, whether he's probably going to miss Argentina. Is it going to be any more rounds than that? And you said it last time, he can't afford to have any of these big hits. So a big opening question to you to start the show. Is it is it better for Marquez just to get out while he still can, cut and run? It's definitely better for him physically. There's no doubt about that. Mentally, it won't be better for him, obviously. Um, the clock is ticking, I think. I think we've all felt that for some time. Originally, when he didn't get hurt, when he used to crash a lot, we'd all say it's only a matter of time. Then he started to get hurt and we'd all say, you know, Eventually, he's going to have a massive one here and it's going to be career ending. Um, Nobody wants to see it. Nobody even really wants to discuss it, to be absolutely honest with you. But it's something that as journalists and as speculators, I suppose, of the sport, we've got to. You know, this injury that he's got at the moment, it's not like, if I may put it, like a mechanical injury where you've got a situation where you've got a broken arm or a pin or or whatever it might be that you can fix something mechanically. Um, An eye injury is, is... for me, being completely non-medical, is a bit like a brain injury. It's something that you can't you can't do anything about. It is what it is, and you've got to get over whatever the circumstances of it are. And uh, worryingly, the more he has, the more this is going to compound his fragility. And every time he falls down, and every time he recovers from this now, he is going to be subconsciously nervous of everything that he used to do like extending an arm, like making a move of any kind. This is going to have a compounding effect on his performance, on his mental well-being, and on where he ends up during the course of 2022. I I just have to feel that the writing is on the wall from my point of view. You you, you didn't push me too hard on whether I was going to make a a comment like this, but I'm I'm going to, Harry, anyway. It's looking like Mark Marquez is at the end of a career that looked like he had a fair way to still to run. And only due to injury he might be okay but how many we know his style is to crash his style is to save the unsavable and the ones that are completely unsavable even for him turn into quite big crashes and you cannot bang your head how many times have i talked about it how many times has it, has it been talked about that we are very concerned with him motor gp in the industry i'm very concerned that we don't do enough about head injuries, about concussion, about these kind of crashes. It's a very, very difficult subject to get the better of when the understanding behind it all is is it's difficult to diagnose each individual correctly um, immediately. But I would think that it's fairly obvious in Marquez's case that he's had another massive bang on the head and it's caused the eye injury of whatever he's got wrong again this time around. How long can he keep doing it? Not much longer, in my view. The, the numbers don't look good. If you just, you know, forgetting all the medical details, that say, you know, the fact that it was 10 years between the first episode of this double vision and the second, and now it's only been five months between the second and the third, that in itself sort of illustrates the concern, doesn't it? And it, when, uh, when Mark came back, he, you know, he said that he'd spoken to his doctor when he came back at the Sepang test and said, look, what's the chances of this happening again? And and the doctors were, were pretty clear with him. You know, it, it, it's the same chance in two weeks as it is in two years. Keith was, Keith was explaining, this isn't like a normal injury that we're used to hearing with bones and things like that. It's almost almost like a, a digital injury and in that it's either on or off, isn't it? it? It's almost like 
he's either got the double vision and then it, it, it comes, you know, he, he rests and it takes quite a long time, a few months last time, and he's okay again. And then suddenly it comes back and there's almost, there's no in between. It's either on or off. And it must be so frustrating, even just on a, on, on a human level. You know, we can, we can all think of people that have been through a serious illness, or let alone an injury, and then they have a relapse and they have to go through it all again. And Heath was mentioning the mental toll. I mean, he, you know, Marquez put on Twitter, didn't he, that he's, he's going to try and smile, but it's not easy. And you can see, you can imagine how he must be feeling just from that alone. Forget the fact he's a MotoGP star. Going through something and then having it all come back again in such a short amount of time, really, it's a, it's you know it's a it's a it's a horrible situation to be in for him, isn't it? Um, we know what the rough sort of timeline is that early this week he's going to have another checkup. Over the winter, Mark moved from outside Barcelona. He's now based near Madrid, and it seems that he went there because uh, to be nearer the, the medical team that are looking after his shoulder. So that, so he's now sort of that's where he's based. But his eye doctor is the, is the eye doctor he's been dealing with since the, the 2011 Sepang Motor 2 accident. He's in Barcelona. So people might have been a bit confused as to why he went to see two different doctors in two different cities. Well, that's what's happening there. So this check this week will be in Barcelona. Now, we don't know if it's today as we're speaking Monday or if it'll be Tuesday, but something will come out of that where a decision will be made clearly, do you go to Argentina or not? It'll almost be more difficult if Marquez has woken up and, oh, my eye's okay. What do you do then? You know, as Keith's been saying, you, when, when you've had it come back after a couple of accidents, what do you do? I mean, he's probably fallen less than 10 times since he's come back from the injury at the end of last October. And it's happened again. So, you know, how do you play this? Will he go through the whole sequence of try a motocross bike first, then have a checkup? then have a track day at high speed, then another checkup, and then come back. Well, if you're doing all that, as he, as he did previously before Sepang, that's going to drag things out, isn't it? That's, gonna, that's, that's a long time. So, yeah, I, I think this, this checkup this week is, is going to be a big, a big one as far as what happens with Mark this season. And the checkup needs to be one that is supervised by somebody from the FIM, from Dorna, from Erta. I mean, it's something where it has to be very... Sp- you can't ride... 200 mile an hour motorcycle in amongst other 200 mile an hour motorcycles if this is going to be something that might be you know that might trip him up in that situation it's just horrendous you can't take someone else out with a slightly dodgy eye um it, it's it's something that needs overseeing it needs something that, that that needs a little bit of um thought behind before he makes that comeback i'm sure i'm sure mark won't make a comeback if he's not a hundred percent but the temptation is always there you know, what, what, at what point, <laughs> again, if I go back to the mechanical injury, mechanical injury, you could be going through a whole load of pain, not have the movement you should have, not have the muscle strength you should have, and yet you're still allowed to ride because you overcome that situation. But if you've got concussion or a, a brain injury or an eye injury, that is something that is much more difficult to perhaps legislate for, for in the way that Erta, the FIM Dorna, should or have to do. Because, you know, who who says his eyes fixed? You know, riders being riders will ride if they get given an opportunity, um, particularly if they think they can get around whatever the slight problem they've got is. Um, so the, this is going to throw up several questions as, as these next week or two progress, I think, with Mark. Uh, who's checking on the checkers? Who's checking on the guy who says, yeah, we think he's OK? What tests are there for this? I mean, you know, I feel like we're in a bit of a grey area here. I don't really feel like I know enough about the injury that he's had. Although, you know, like everyone else, I've been reading up on it, but it kind of still leaves me with thinking, well, blimey, that, that, that could happen at any time. Like you said, Pete, it, it, it's something that could come back in a, in a, in a heartbeat. And, and if that's the case, you know, chucking a 200 mile an hour motorbike around in front of a whole lot of other 200 mile an hour motorbikes is um, a bit less than desirable, maybe. Yeah, well, it's certainly uh, crunch time, isn't it? And, and, a, and a scary time and, and a rough time for Mark Marquez to be going through. Um, well, as we, as Pete says, we're awaiting news for what the uh, what the news will be uh, when it comes to whether Mark will race this weekend. I can think I can say it's well, well, who knows? But it's unlikely based on previous things. But never say never. But uh, keep across crash dot net for all the latest on that uh, as and when it happens. Um, now. Indonesia was the last race. We will look ahead to Argentina in a bit, but there's a few more stories that have sort of developed since Indonesia, including Pete, uh, one of our rookies, uh, Remy Gardner. Um, Usually 
pretty good in the wet. He's got good historic results in the wet from his Moto2 days as well. But a, a helmet full of water in the end didn't make his Indonesian Grand Prix too comfortable either. And it's a bizarre story, this, isn't it? Yeah, in fairness, he wasn't the only one. Paul Espargaro, it seems, also might have had a helmet issue of some kind. It, 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 uh, I mean, there was a lot of spray at the start, as we saw at the start of the race. Now, Keith can explain exactly what, what the riders would normally do to prepare for a wet race, but it seems like the water basically somehow got inside the helmet. So that that's these are the, this is more from Hervé Poncherol than from, from Remy himself. Remy did speak sort of of a a bit of a visibility issue, but we weren't exactly sure on the details of it. But Hervé Poncherol clearly felt that it really held Remy back. And you could see from his lap times, when he dropped to the back of the field by mid-distance. And then once he was away from the spray of the other bikes, he was setting quick times. I mean, he, I think it was the 14th best lap of the race. So he had the speed when he, when he could see. So I think a lot of frustration there as to, uh, you know, a potential good result gone missing. Sometimes you have to go old school when it comes to this stuff. Helmet misting or water inside the helmet. Airflow is what it's all about. And at the end of the day, you don't get a lot of time for wet testing. There's not been a lot of wet testing. There's not been, a, particularly in groups of people, you don't get that opportunity. So when you've got a, a kind of vacuum behind the, the windscreen, if you want to call it that, you know, how that wind interacts with other bikes around you and so on and so forth, what's coming up underneath the, the fairing or around the fairing and blowing up underneath your chin, massive differences you might be blowing a bit harder as well you're breathing a bit harder in a race situation than you are maybe in a test situation everything is different um, and it's usually in these situations where it's thrown up i mean you know in 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 the olden days there'd be all sorts of stuff going on like you'd have duct tape over your nose and squidging out under the helmet to make sure your breath went downhill instead of mixing up with with whatever you'd put on the, the inside of the visor to make it clear uh, anybody who wears <laughs> A good example, maybe anybody who wears glasses and then has to pop a mask on to go into the supermarket or something. The first thing that happens is it blows all steam under your glasses because you haven't prepped your glasses properly. I'm not saying for a second Remy didn't prep properly. I'm bloody sure he did. But the point being is, is that you change the circumstances slightly and all of a sudden it's a I can't see anything um, situation. And, and water inside the helmet sounds to me like he had you know, airflow over the bike. And the, the, the excess of, of spray that was coming off of everything in front of him was so great that it was getting up inside his helmet. It's a pretty rare thing um, and not easy to overcome, even for the future. Having experienced what he's experienced, he will have an idea about what he's going to do about it next time. The helmet manufacturer would get involved. All the helmet manufacturers will be looking at Remy's circumstances for sure, because nobody wants that and certainly don't want it as far as their manufacturer is concerned. But... He won't probably ever have it again. It might be the circumstances might just be that it is what it was at the time and where he was in the field and the, the airflow over the top of that particular motorcycle or whatever it might have been that gave him that problem. Um, but you can be sure they'll they'll come up with something for next time round. That's for certain. Next time it's raining, yeah, I can just imagine him sitting <laughs> sitting on his road bike while someone's firing a hose at him. <laughs> Joking apart, he won't be doing that at all. But uh, it, it's it's still. I mean, it's really annoying for Remy because his season hasn't started where he needed it to start. First the wrist, now this. These little setbacks for him. You know, a bit of a disaster for, for his year so but far. But the only, the only rookie at the moment with a point to his name, I think. I'm just looking at the Darren standings. Darren Binder. Who? Darren Binder. Oh, Darren Binder. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah no. Yeah, okay, yeah. no. They're not the in only the one. In the dry, though, Harry. You're right there. The only one with a point in the dry. Yeah, yeah we go. Yeah, say. nice save. Yeah. Thank you. Know you. I love, I love that, Pete. You're a kind man. You I was like, I was I just nailed thought, oh, the floor with I've, I've done them there. There we go. No, I haven't done that one yet. Yeah, forgot about Darren. Good ride for Darren last time out. Edit point. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but Gardner ahead of Peko Banyaya in the standings at the moment. So uh, there you go. Um, also, uh, Banyaya actually, we might be worth talking about in a minute. But there was a, a bit of a. Um, I don't know if this is the right word, a, a fracas perhaps between uh, Jack Miller and uh, and Fabio Quattararo. I don't think there was any actual physical involvement there, but uh, it seems, Pete, uh, a move in Indonesia last time out has really riled them both up. And, and Fabio has hit back at some Jack Miller criticism of him. Uh, early race contact, it, it seems to have been. Can you just sort of explain a bit about what's gone on here? Because it seems a bit unlikely these two sort of coming for each other like this. 
Well, well, yeah, it wasn't that obvious to us watching on TV, was it? But at the end of the race, it seems Jack was quite visibly unhappy with, with Fabio. And then it sort of transpired that earlier in the race at turn one, I think um, Jack had passed Quattararo on the inside, I think, and then sort of drifted wide a bit. And, and Quattararo had sort of squared under him and then their lines had crossed on the exit. Now, it's at that point that, that <laughs> there's a bit of a disagreement. Now, now Jack Miller believed that, that Quattararo sort of rode into his leg, basically, was what he said. Um, and didn't need to be that aggressive, certainly not at that point of the race and things like that. He also felt that Quattro made a similar move with, with Zarco when Zarco passed him. Uh, now, Fabio, as, as you would have seen, felt very differently about it and, and said that he did nothing wrong. And it was just, uh, he, he invited uh, other riders to give their opinion, actually, because he was interested to know, because as far as he was concerned, it was a fair enough move. And, you know, one rider goes by and you, you try and fight back. So, yeah, that, that was all that was about, really. That sounds like the the equivalent of Twitter, Twitter, Twitter trolling to me. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get everyone else on your side when you've got an opinion about something. I'm not sure I agree with that from Quattararo's point of view. Jack, you know, he's fairly tough and he's made some fairly tough moves. Quattararo, I mean, it kind of goes back to what we talked about last time out. Um, you know, in Indonesia, I think I said something along the lines of Zarko just didn't, for whatever reason, whether it was him physically or whether it was the bike wasn't able to he didn't make the moves he should have made to move himself forward he just didn't look capable of making those moves Quattararo did so he was in that kind of mood all the way through the the race and if Jack Jack might also have been a little bit frustrated from the point of view that it's the kind of race conditions he would have expected him to have done really well at on the Ducati with his performance and, and that sort of leads us in a bit to Argentina if you remember what he did to grab his pole there the last time we were out there in 2019 or whenever it was um, it was a fantastic lap. So Jack has got a bit of a reputation for being able to make those kind of slightly adverse conditions work for him. And they didn't. He finished fourth off the podium. Quattararo went forward at the end of the race as well. So it would have been like rubbing salt in the wounds. But, you know, rubbing his racing a little bit. There's no way that I would disrespect Jack's view. He obviously felt strongly enough to, to mention it. And Quattararo came back at him. Yeah, with what he had to say, really, it sounds a bit like handbags to me, to be frank with you. Let's get on with Argentina. Absolutely. Well, I think a congratulations as well to Jack Miller, who recently got engaged over the weekend, I think it was, on social media. So uh, clearly he's not letting the argument uh, get on his mind too much. <laughs> 